Section 22 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Vagabonds of Space. Chapter 7 Rapaju Didis was setting up and adjusting the complicated mechanisms of his little black case. A dozen vacuum tubes lighted, and a murmur of throbbing energy came from a helix of shining metallic ribbon that topped the whole. Flexible cables led to a cap-like contrivance, which Didis placed on his head. He frowned in concentration. The psycho-ray apparatus, Aura explained. He's sending a message to the city. Evidently, the influence of the ray was directive. They had no inkling of the thoughts transmitted from the alert brain of the scientist, but from the look of satisfaction on his face they could see that he was obtaining the desired contact. Rapajou! he exclaimed, switching off the power of his instrument. Commander of the fleet of the Lotta. I have advised him of our arrival, told him that a Martian and a terrestrial wish to treat with him concerning the proposed invasion of their planets. His answering thought first was of fiercest rage, then conciliatory in nature. He'll receive you and listen to your arguments, though he promises nothing. Is that satisfactory? Yes, Carr and Mado were agreed. At least it would give them a chance to look over the ground and to make plans, should any occur to them. The nomads circled over the heart of the city, and soon Mado saw a suitable landing space. They settled gracefully in an open area, close by the building indicated by Didis, as that of the administration officials of the city. A group of squat, sullen Lotta awaited them, and, without speaking a word either of hatred or welcome, led them into the forbidding entrance of the building. Close-set, beady eyes, unbelievably flat features of chalky whiteness, chunky, bowed legs, bare and hairy, long arms with huge, dangling paws. These were the outstanding characteristics of the Lotta. Mado stared straight before him, refusing to display any great interest in the loathsome creatures, but Carr was frankly curious, and as frankly disapproving. Rapaju leered maliciously when the four voyagers stood before him. He looked the incarnation of all that was evil and vile, a monster among monsters. Sensing him to be the more aggressive of the two visitors from doomed planets, he addressed his remarks to Carr. "'You come to plead with the Rapajou,' he sneered, his coast tinged with an outlandish accent, "'to beg for the worthless lives of your compatriots, for the wealth of your cities.' "'We come to reason with you,' replied Carr haughtily. "'If you are capable of reasoning, what is this incredible thing you are planning?' Mado gasped at the effrontery of his friend, but Carr was oblivious of the warning looks cast in his direction. "'Enough of that!' snapped Rapaju. "'I'll do the talking, you the reasoning. "'I have a proposition to make you, and if you know what's best, you'll agree.' Otherwise, you'll be the first of the terrestrials to die. Is that clear? Clear enough, all right, growled Carr. What do you mean, a proposition? Ha! I thought you'd listen. My offer is the lives of you and your companion in exchange for your assistance in guiding my fleet to the capital cities of your countries. Not that our plans will be changed if you refuse, but that much time will be saved in this manner and quick victory made certain without undue sacrifice of valuable property. You! You! Carr stammered in anger. But there was no use in raising a rumpus now. They'd only kill him. Something might be accomplished if he pretended to accede. Go on with your story, he finished lamely. In addition to sparing your lives, I'll place you both in high position after we seize your respective planets, make you chief officers in the prison lands we intend to establish for your countrymen, 
What do you say? Will you give us time to talk it over and think about it? Until the hour of departure, if you wish. Carr bowed, avoiding Mado's questioning eyes. He looked at Aura, where she stood at the side of Didis. She flashed him a guarded smile. He knew that she understood. Rapaju relaxed. He was confident he could bribe these puerile foreigners to help him in the great venture, and sadly he needed such help. The Lotta were not navigators. Their knowledge of the heavens was sadly incomplete. They had no maps of the surfaces of the planets to be visited. Their simultaneous blows would be far more effective, and the campaign much shorter if they could choose the most vital centers for the initial attacks. Now, he said, that we understand one another, let us talk further of the plans. Then you will be able to consider carefully before making your decision. Rapaju could be diplomatic when he wished. Carr longed to sink his fingers in the hairy throat, but he smiled hypocritically and found an opportunity to wink meaningfully at Mado. This was going to be good, and who knew? Perhaps they might find some way to outwit these mad savages. To think of them in control of the inner planets was revolting. They retired to a small room with Rapaju and four of his lieutenants, Didis and Aura accompanying them. Aura sat close to Carr at the circular table in Rapaju's council. Carr thought grimly of the board meetings in faraway New York. Rapaju talked. He told of the armament of his vessels, painting vivid pictures of the destruction to be wrought in the cities of Terra, of Mars and Venus. His great hairy paws clutched at imaginary riches when he spoke glowingly of the plundering to follow. He spoke of the women of the inner planets, and Carr half rose from his seat when he observed the lecherous glitter in his beady eyes. Aura, great God, was she safe here? He stole a glance at the girl, and a recurrence of the awful fear surged through him. In her leather garment, close-fitting and severe, she looked like a boy. Perhaps they would not know. Besides, there was the perpetual treaty with Europa. It always had been observed, Didis said. As Rapaju expanded upon the glories to come, he told perforce of many of the details of the plans. One thing stood out in Carr's mind. The vessels of the Lotta were not equal to the Nomad in many respects. They must carry their entire supply of fuel from the starting point, and this was calculated as but a small percentage in excess of that required to carry them to their destination. Their speed was not as great as the Nomad's, by at least a third. If the Nomad led the fleet from Ganymede, they might be able to get them off their course, cause them to run out of fuel out in the vacuum and absolute zero of space. He kicked Mado under the table and arose to ask a few leading questions. Aura was whispering to her father, and he nodded his head as if in complete agreement with what she was saying. These two were not deceived by his apparent traitorous talk, but Mado was aghast. Carr wondered if Rapaju believed him, as did his friend. "'We'll do it, Rapaju,' he stated finally. "'In our ship, the Nomad, we'll guide you across the trackless wastes of the heavens. We'll take you to our capital cities, point out to you the riches of the industrial centers. We have no love for our own worlds. Mado and I deserve them for a life of vagabondage among the stars. We ask no reward other than that we be permitted to leave once more on our travels, to roam space as we choose. Mado attempted to voice an objection, but Carr's hand was heavy on his shoulder. Shut up, you fool! He hissed in his ear. Can't you trust me? Rapaju's eyes seemed to draw closer together as he returned Carr's unflinching stare. He walked around the table and stood at the side of the tall terrestrial. Suddenly he grasped Aura's jacket, tore it open at the throat. He ran his hairy fingers over the bare shoulder of the shrinking girl and gurgled in delight at the velvet smoothness of her skin. With a roar like a wild animal, Carr was upon him, bearing him to the floor. His fingers were in that hairy throat where they had itched to twine. "'Dirty, filthy beast!' he was snarling. "'Lay your foul hands on Aura, will you? "'Say your prayers if you know any, you swine!' Then his muscles went limp, and he was jerked to his feet by a terrible force, a force that sent him reeling and gasping against the wall. 
One of Rapaju's lieutenants stood before him with a tiny weapon in his hand. The weapon which had released the paralyzing gas he breathed. He was choking, suffocating. A black mist rose before him. He felt his knees give way. Dimly, as in a dream, he saw that Aura was in Dita's arms. Rapaju was on his feet, fingering his neck and laughing horribly. The treaty, Rapaju! Ditas was shouting. Aura was sobbing. Mado was in the hands of two of the vile Lota, struggling wildly to free himself. The Martian's eyes accused him. He shut his own and groaned, opened them again, but it was no use. Everything in the room was whirling now, crazily. He fought to regain his senses, crawled weakly toward the squat figure of Rapaju, where it swayed and twisted and spun around. Then all was darkness. The gas had taken its toll. Chapter 8 The Expedition Carr awakened to a sense of wordless disgust. Fool that he was to spill the beans as he had, all set to put one over on the leader of the Lotta, then to come a cropper like this. He knew he had been spared for a purpose. The gas was not intended to kill, only to render him helpless for a time. He opened his eyes to the light of the familiar room. He had awakened before in his bed. It was his own cabin on board the Nomad. What had happened? Had he dreamed it all? Europa? Aura? Rapaju? All of it? He sat up and felt his aching head. Oh, are you awake? A soft voice greeted him. Aura! he exclaimed. It was indeed she, beautiful as ever. Shh! she warned, placing the tip of a finger to his lips. They'll hear us. Who? he whispered. Rapaju? His two guards? They're in the control cabin with father and Mado. What? They've taken the nomad? Yes, we're under way. They've forced Mado to guide them. But do not trust him. Rapaju spared you, as he believes you more capable. He'll hold you to your word. Lord, but what are you doing here? Aura dropped her eyes. He, Rapaju, she said, inferred from your action in assaulting him that you were very fond of me. He holds me as a hostage for your good behavior. Father volunteered to come along. He persuaded Rapaju to allow it, swore allegiance to his cause. Of course, he wouldn't leave me. Carr gazed at her in admiration of her courage. She had been nursing him, too. What a girl she was. Aura, he said huskily. Rapaju was right. I am fond of you. More than fond. I love you. I never knew I could feel this way. Oh, Carr, you mustn't. She drew back as he scrambled to his feet. They'll find us. We must not show that we care. Rapaju is a beast. He wants me for himself, and is delaying the time only until you have brought the fleet safely to the inner planets, and to their great cities. He— The skunk! Wants you to himself, does he? Why— Why didn't I kill him? But, Aura, you said you do care— Ha! I thought so! Rapaju stood in the doorway, grinning mockingly at the pair. The impetuous terrestrial is up and about, back at his old game. Please, please, for my sake, Carr. Aura pressed him back as he tensed his muscles for a spring. Sorry I was so slow, Carr grated over her shoulder. Another five seconds, Rapaju, and I'd have had your windpipe out by the roots. Rapaju scowled darkly and fingered his throat. But, my dear Carr, you were too slow, he said. And I live, and shall live, while you shall die. Meanwhile, you'll carry out your agreement. Come, Aura. The girl hesitated for a moment, then, with a pleading glance at Carr, stepped from the room. All right now, Parker, snapped Rapaju, into your clothes and into the pilot's seat. You'll stay there, too, till the journey's over. Get busy. One of his guards had appeared in the doorway. Carr knew that resistance was useless. Besides, seated at those controls, he might think of something. Rapaju would never get Aura if he could help it. 
Mado's shoulders drooped, and his face was haggard and drawn, but he summoned a smile when he saw Carr. "'Hello, Carr,' he said. "'You all right?' "'Sure. Rapaju says I've got to take the controls.' "'Very well.' Mado shrugged his broad shoulders and slipped from the pilot's seat. Two ugly Lata guards were watching, ray pistols in hand. "'The chart is corrected, Carr, and—' "'Never mind the conversation,' Rapaju snarled. "'There'll be no talk between you at all. Beat it to your cabin, Mado.' The Martian glowered and made as if to retort hotly. "'But, Rapaju,' Thetis interposed, speaking from his position at one of the ports, "'they'll have to consult regarding the course of the vessel. Mado is more familiar than Carr with the navigation of space.' "'Shut up!' roared Rapaju. "'I know what I'm doing, and what's more, you'll not converse with him either. I'm running this expedition, and I'm not taking any chances.' Didis subsided, and followed Mado through the passage to the sleeping cabins. The ensuing silence was ominous. Carr could feel the eyes of the Lotta upon him as he examined the adjustments of the controls and peeped through the telescope. A glance at the velocity indicator showed him that they were traveling at a rate of eight hundred miles a second. He studied the chart and soon made out their position. Jupiter was a hundred million miles behind them, and they were heading almost due sunward. The automatic control mechanism was not functioning. Evidently, Mado had kept this a secret, and for a purpose. He wished he could talk with his friends. They'd plan something. "'Like your job?' Rapaju was gloating over his terrestrial, who had dared to lay hands upon him. "'Yes, but not the company.' Carr was disdainful. You like it less before I've finished with you. And get this straight. You think we're dependent on you to guide us to the inner planets, and that we'll not harm any of you until they are reached. Don't fool yourself. I've watched Mado, and I've spent much time in the excellent library of the Nomad. I've learned plenty about the navigation of space, and can reach those planets as quickly and directly as you. But it pleases me to see you work. So work you shall. I'll check you carefully, and don't think you can deceive me. Don't try to depart from the true course. The sun is my check as it is yours, and I'll keep constant tab on your position. Get it? A rather long speech, Rapaju. Carr grinned into the evil face of the commander. Still defiant, eh? Suits me, Carr Parker. We'll have some nice talks here, and then, when it pleases me, you'll suffer. You shall live to see your home city crash in utter ruin, your people slain, starved, beaten, and above all, there's Aura. Don't defile her name in your ugly mouth, you— Carr bit his tongue to keep back the torrent of invectives that sprang to his lips. This would never do. He'd get himself bumped off before they were well started, and while there was life, there was hope. He'd stick to his guns, and think. Think and plan. If only he could have a few words with Mado. They must get out of this mess. There must be a way. There must. Rapaju was laughing in triumph. Thought he had cowed him, did he? Boastful savage. If he could navigate the nomad himself, why didn't he? Liar! He and Mado were godsends to him, and he knew it. His speech at the council table had been the real truth. Foreign thoughts entered his mind. Didis, good old Didis, was using his thought apparatus in his own cabin. He paid no attention to the words of Rapaju when he left the control room. Didis was on the job. Between them they'd outwit this devil of Ganymede. "'Keep your courage,' came the message." I've read the thoughts of Mado, and he bids you examine the chart carefully. He's made some notations in the ancient language of Mars. The automatic control of the nomad can be used when necessary. He has not advised Rapaju of its existence. Carr was encouraged, and he concentrated on a suitable reply. But, though he did not consciously will it, his thoughts were of Aura. Instantly there came the reassurance of her father. Aura is not in immediate danger. 
Rapaju is saving her for his revenge on you, and I'm watching her constantly. A ray pistol is concealed in my clothing, its charge ready for the foul creature in case he should lay hands on her, but you must plan an escape, and salvation for your worlds. Examine the chart at once. He looked from the corner of his eye, and saw that one of the lot of guards was watching intently. He peered into the eyepiece of the telescope, made an inconsequential change in one of the adjustments. The guard stirred, but did not arise. He looked at the chart with new interest, scanned its markings carefully. What had Mado marked for his attention? There were hundreds of notations, some in Kos and a few in ancient Martian, all in Mado's painstaking chirography. Ah, there it was, a tiny spot almost on their course, with Mado's minute notation. Sargasso Sea. What did it mean? Did Mado intend to lead the fleet into the embrace of that dreadful monster they had so fortunately escaped? An excellent idea to save the inner planets, but suicide for them. He'd do it, though, if it weren't for Aura. She was so sweet and innocent. She must not die, must not suffer. Another way must be found. He groaned aloud as he realized that her predicament was the result of his own bull-headedness. If only he hadn't insisted on the trip to Ganymede. But then there was the problem of preserving the civilization of the inner planets. It had to be met. There was a commotion behind him, a feminine shriek from the after-cabins, loud shoutings from the beast called Rapaju. Carr's heart skipped a beat. He was paralyzed with fear, but only for an instant. With a bellow of rage, he whirled around and started for the door, charging the two guards with head down and arms flailing. End of chapter 8 Vagabonds of Space Read by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York Section 23 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Vagabonds of Space. Chapter 9. Nemesis. The Lada did not use their ray pistols. They were too busy attempting to elude the mad rushes of the powerful terrestrial. Besides, there were good reasons they should not kill him. Yet. Carr drove one of them halfway down the passage with a well-planted punch. The other was on his back, hairy legs twined around his waist, an arm under his chin, drawing his head back with a steady and terrible pressure. He whirled around, trying to shake off his beastly antagonist. But these powerful legs and arms held fast. He tore at the hairy ankles where they crossed in the pit of his stomach, wrenched them free. Still the creature clung to him, twisting his head until it seemed his neck might break. He found a waving foot with his right hand, wrenched it mightily. There was a sharp snap, and the foot dangled limp in his fingers. He had broken the ankle. With a howl of pain, his assailant let go and dropped to the floor to crawl away like a whipped cur. In a flash, Carr saw that the brute was reaching for his ray pistol where it had dropped during the encounter. He kicked it from the reach of that hairy paw and sprang after it. With one of those little weapons in his hands, the odds would change. His fingers closed on its grip just as Aura rushed into the room, closely followed by Rapaju, whose distorted features were terrible to behold. The cabin was full of them now. The guard he had first knocked down, the lust-crazed commander, the one with the broken ankle, all but Didus and Mado. Carr faced them alone. So close was Rapaju to the girl that he dared not use the pistol. And now the uninjured guard was circling him, trying to get in a position where he could use his ray pistol without endangering his commander. Carr fumbled for the release of the weapon he held in his hand. Found it. The guard threw himself on the floor when he saw it raised, shouted a warning, but it was too late. The deadly ray had sped on its mission of death, struck him full in the middle. The twisted body lay still a moment, and then collapsed, like a punctured balloon. 
leaving his scant clothing in a limp heap, empty. A worthy miniature of the D-ray, this little weapon. He turned to face Rabajou and saw that he was shielding himself with Aura's body. She had fainted and now hung drooping in the arms of the beast. Where was Mado? Didis? Good God, he'd killed them! Carr thought of that little spot on the chart. Must be very close now. They'd pass so near there'd be no escape. But he could not reach the controls without taking his eyes from Rapaju. That would have to wait. Rapaju was backing toward the door, still holding the limp figure of the girl before him. The injured Gar lay moaning on the floor. Drop her, you devil! Carr shouted desperately as he saw that Rapaju soon would reach the passageway. Then suddenly he reached for the controls and pushed the energy lever to full speed forward. He braced himself for the shock of acceleration and saw Rapaju and Aura thrown backward into the passageway, the girl's body cushioned by that of her captor as they were flung violently to the floor. Madly he rushed to the narrow entrance and tore at the hairy arms that encircled the slender waist of the girl. He jerked the snarling commander of the Lada expedition to his feet and slammed him against the metal wall. "'Now, you damn pig!' he grunted. "'I'll finish the job, dirty scum of a rotten world!' He dragged his victim into the control cabin and threw him to the floor. But Rapaju was like an eel. He wriggled from under him and snatched from the heap of clothing the ray pistol of the disintegrated guard. With a yelp of triumph he rose to his knees and leveled the weapon. A well-placed kick sent it spinning and Carr was upon him. He snapped back the head with a terrible punch, then lifted the dazed creature to his feet and stepped back. "'Stand up and take it like a man!' he roared. Rapaju shook his head to clear it, and rushed in with a bellow of rage, just what Carr had wanted. Starting almost from the floor, his right came up to meet the vicious jaw with a crack that told of the terrific power behind it. Lifted from his feet and hurled halfway across the room by the impact, Rapaju lay motionless where he fell. Carr was at the telescope. Their speed was close to fifteen hundred miles a second. The monstrous mass of Mado's Sargasso Sea loomed close in his vision, off their course by a hundred miles or more. They'd miss it all right. He had the situation in hand now on board the Nomad, but how about the fleet behind them? He thought fast and furiously. Another two minutes and they'd pass the thing, the inexplicable horror which had accounted for the golden sphere of the Europans. Could he use it? Suppose the fleet of the enemy— the idea was full of possibilities. He rushed to the stern compartment and scanned the heavens for the massed bodies of spheres he knew would be the fleet of the Lada. At this speed they must have fallen far behind. Yes, they were there. Not so far behind at that. The battle in the control room must have been a shorter one than it had seemed. He returned quickly to the controls and reversed the energy to give the fleet a chance to catch up to him. Closer came that mass of whitish jelly, and now it was much larger than before. The terrible creature, for living matter it was, beyond doubt, was growing with the rapidity of a rising flood. Great tentacles of its horrid translucent substance reached in all directions for possible victims. He sickened at the sight. But what a fate for the fleet of the Lada, if only he could maneuver them into its influence. He changed his course slightly and headed directly for the monster, again increasing speed. Perhaps, if he calculated the forces correctly, he could dive through it again with the D-ray to clear a path. But no, it was a miracle they had escaped before, and now the vicious thing was more than double its previous size. Once more he altered his course. He'd cross in front of the thing, skim it as close as he dared, and shoot from its influence on the far side. The greater mass of the enemy vessels and their lack of a quick-acting repulsive force would prove their undoing. Full speed ahead. A rapid mental calculation, an educated guess, rather, and he set the automatic control. Turning around to start for the stern compartment, he saw that Aura had recovered from her swoon, and now stood swaying weakly in the passageway. "'Aura!' he exclaimed delightedly. He rushed to her side and supported her in a tender embrace. Rapaju? she questioned with horror in her eyes. Won't bother you for a while, dear. But your father, Mado. He gasped them. They'll recover. The brave girl had regained her composure. Good, but come, 
Time's short. He half carried her to the rear, berating himself the while for his inability to pay her closer attention. With arms still around her, he placed her at one of the stern ports. What is it, Carr? She sensed his excitement. The fleet. See? We'll destroy them. The spherical vessels were close behind, huddled together in mass formation and following the nomad blindly. How, Carr? Lead them into it. Wait till you see. There's a... The nomad lurched and changed direction. Cold fear clutched at his throat. That devil of a guard! Why hadn't he killed him? He dashed through the passage, aura at his heels. Sure enough, the crippled guard had dragged himself to the controls, was manipulating the energy director as he had seen Mado do. They were heading directly for the terrible monster of the heavens. No need now to peer through the telescope. The thing was visible to the naked eye. No power could save them. Carr hurled himself at the guard and tore at the hairy paw which gripped the lever. The throbbing of strange energies filled the air of the room, and Carr's brain pulsed with the maddening rhythm. The red discharge appeared at the projections of the control panels. He forgot the fleet of the Lada, forgot the menace to his own world. Only Aura mattered now, and he had not the power to save her. As in a daze he knew he was wrenching mightily at the body of the powerful minion of Rabajou. His fingers encountered heated metal, one of the ray pistols. He felt the intense vibration of the weapon as its charge was released, but he still lived. The beast who held it had missed. Dimly he was conscious of the screams of Aura, of the yielding of the creature who fought him. An animal cry registered on his consciousness, and he shook the suddenly limp Lada from him. He knew somehow that his last enemy was gone. A quick glance showed him that Aura was still on her feet, braced against the wall. The red veil was before his eyes. He grasped the controls and fought desperately to keep his strength and senses. A streamer of horrid whiteness swung across his vision, slithered clamily over the glass of one of the forward ports. They were into the thing. It was the end. He groaned aloud as he fumbled with the mechanisms and strove to formulate a plan of escape. The fleet he knew was just behind. An enormous mass. The repulsive energy astern would be terrific. He turned it full on. The whiteness obscured his vision, then it was gone once more. A single streamer waved before him and encompassed them. The movement of these members must be inconceivably rapid, else they'd be invisible at the speed the nomad was traveling. Full speed ahead. The repulsion full on in the direction of the center of the mass as well as astern. The framework of the nomad creaked protestingly from the terrific forces that tore at her vitals. Then, suddenly, they were released. The nomad was shooting off into space. The resultant of those combined forces had done the trick. Only the edge of that devilfish of space had they touched. Free. They were free of the monster. The red veil lifted. He rushed to Aura's side. She was kneeling at one of the floor ports, breathing heavily, but unharmed. Below them they saw the swiftly receding mass the fleet of the Lada diving headlong, drawn inexorably into the rapacious embrace of that vile creature of the heavens. An instant the awful whiteness of the thing closed in greedily about the many spheres of the fleet, swallowed them from sight, and contorted madly and with seeming glee over the triumph. Then, in a burst of blinding incandescence, it was gone. The monster, the fleet, everything, blasted into nothingness. The fuel storage compartments of the vessels of Ganymede had exploded. The heavens were rid of the inexplicable growing menace. The inner planets were saved from a terrible invasion, and the nomad was safe. Aura, Didis, Mado, all were safe. At his side, Aura was trembling. Gently he raised her to her feet and took her into his arms. Chapter 10 Vagabonds All Together they cared for Didis and Mado, made them comfortable in their bunks until the time when the effects of the gas would wear off. Luckily it was that Rapaju had used the gas pistol rather than the ray. Perhaps it had been a mistake, 
or perhaps he had needed the scientific knowledge of Didus, the familiarity with the inner planets that was Mado's. At any rate, they had no delusions regarding his designs on Aura, or his hatred of Carr. By his own passions had the commander of the fleet been led to the error that cost him his life and made possible the destruction of his fleet. By his own passions had the commander of the fleet been led to the error that cost him his life and made possible the destruction of his fleet. Carr was torn by conflicting emotions. The delectable little European was most disturbing. He'd never had much use for the other sex, on earth, too dominating most of them, and always thrown at his head by designing parents for his money. But Aura was different. Her very nearness set his pulses racing, and he knew that she cared for him as he did for her. Those moments in the control cabin after the explosion. But something had come over him since he cut loose from the old life. Wanderlust. That was it. He'd never go back. Neither would he be content to settle down to a domestic life in Paladar. Wanted to be up and going somewhere. Oh, Carr! Carr! Aura's voice called to him. Mado is awake. He wants you. Good old Mado. Why couldn't they just continue on their way as they had started out, roaming the universe in search of other adventures? But the silvery tinkling of Aura's laughter reached his ears. She was irresistible. He forgot his doubts as he hurried to his friend's cabin. Mado was staring at the European maiden with a ludicrous expression of astonishment. Gawping, Carr called it, and Aura was laughing at him. Your friend, she gurgled, doesn't believe he's alive, or that I am, or you. Tell him we are. Carr grinned. Mado did look funny at that. Hello, old sock, he said. Had a bad dream. Did I? Oh, boy! Mado rocked to and fro, his head in his hands. Then he displayed sudden, intense interest. Rapperjou, he asked. His guards. The fleet. What's happened? Ha-ha! <laughs> now you know you're alive, Carr laughed. But the others are dead and gone. The fleet's gone to smash, and how? But, Carr, how did you do it? Tell me. Your Sargasso Sea did it, and it's a thing of the past, too. Wait till I tell you about it. Aura tripped from the room as Carr sat on the edge of the bunk to spin his yarn. But man alive! Mado exclaimed when the story was finished. Don't you know you've done a miraculous thing? I'd never have had the nerve. That damn creature out there had more than four times its former attracting energy. That's what made it impossible for the fleet to get away, and you, you, lucky devil, you just doped it out right. The fleet of the Lotta gave you a tremendous push from astern when you used the repulsive energy. If they hadn't been there with their enormous mass to react against, we'd all have been mincemeat now, along with the Lotta. You terrestrials sure can think fast. Me, now. Lord, if it had been me, I'd have thought of it after my spirit had departed to its reward, or punishment. Glory be, it's the greatest thing I ever heard of. Rats, you'd have done the same thing as I did. Probably would have missed it a mile instead of nearly getting caught as I did. Good thing the fleet's gone, though. Mars and Terra, Venus too. They'll never know how close it was for them. Wouldn't have sense enough to appreciate it anyway. They would if they ever got a taste of what the lot of planned. But what's wrong with you, Carr? You act sore. Want to go home? Me? Don't be like that. No, I'd like to carry on as we planned. There's Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune yet. Planet Nine. A flock of satellites and asteroids. Oh, damn it! Mado looked his amazement. Well, what's to prevent it? He demanded. Nomad's still here, and so are we. I'm just as anxious to keep going as you are. Why not? Picard did not reply. Why not, indeed? He strode from the cabin and into the control room. The nomad was drifting in space, subject only to natural forces that swung it in a vast orbit around the sun. He started the generators and drove the vessel from her temporary orbit with rapid acceleration. Out, out into the jeweled blackness of the heavens. There was Jupiter out there, a bright orb that came suddenly very near when he centered it on the crosshairs of the telescope. 
The excited voices of Aura and Didis came to his ears, the booming speech of Mado. Why couldn't he be sensible and companionable as they were? But a perverse demon kept him at the controls. They'd think him a grouch. Well, maybe he was. But the vastness of the universe beckoned. New worlds to explore, mysteries to be solved, a life of countless new experiences. Anyone would think he was the owner of the Nomad, the way he planned for the future. They were in the control cabin now, Mado and Didis and Aura. A moment he hesitated, eyes glued to the telescope. Then, with a petulant gesture, he reached for the automatic control. Locked it. Shouldn't be this way. They'd think him an awful cad. And they'd be right. He whirled to face them. Thetis was smiling. Mado gazed owlishly solemn. Aura clung to the arms of her father, and her long lashes hid the blue eyes that had played such havoc with the emotions of the terrestrial. Car, Thetis said gently, we must thank you. You saved our lives, you know. Oh, forget it. Saved my own, too, didn't I? By a lucky break. It wasn't luck, Carr. Thetis was gripping his hand now. It was sheer grit and brains. You had them both. If you hadn't used them, we'd all be corpses. Or disintegrated. Excepting Aura, perhaps. And you know the fate that awaited her. Instead, we are alive and well. The fleet is gone. Rapajou's body and that of his guard drift nameless in space where you disposed of them through the airlock of the Nomad. The inner planets need fear no future invasion, for the resources of the Ganymede have been expended in the one huge enterprise that has failed, all through your quick wit and bravery. No, it wasn't luck. Nonsense, Didis. Carr returned the pressure of the scientist's hand, smiling sheepishly. He pushed him away after a moment. He didn't want their gratitude or praise. Didn't know what he wanted. Aura still avoided meeting his gaze. Nonsense, he repeated. And now, please, leave me. You, Didis, Mado, too. I'd like to be alone for a while. With Aura. Mind? Mado's owlish look broadened to a knowing grin as he backed into the passageway. Didis collided with the huge Martian in his eagerness to be out of the room. They were alone, and Carr was on his feet. Nothing mattered now, excepting Aura. Suddenly she was in his arms, the fragrance of her hair in his nostrils. Stargazing, the two of them, it was ridiculous. But the wonders of the universe held a new beauty now for Carr. The distant suns had taken on added brilliance. Still, they beckoned. Carr? The girl whispered after a time. Where are we going? To Europa. Your home. To... To stay? No. Carr was suddenly confident, determined. We'll stop there to break the news. Then we'll be wedded, you and I, according to the custom of your people. Our honeymoon, years of it, will be spent in the Nomad, roving the universe. Mado will agree, I know. Wanderers of the heavens we'll be, Aura, but we'll have each other. And when we've, you've, had enough of it, I'll be ready to settle down. Anywhere you say. Are you game? Oh, Carr, how did you guess? It's just as we'd planned. Father and Mado and I didn't think I'd go, did you, you stupid old dear? Why, why, Aura? Carr was stammering now. He'd thought he was being masterful, making the plans himself. But she'd beat him to it, the adorable little minx. I was a bit afraid, he admitted. And I still can't believe that it's actually true. You're sure you want to? Positive. Why, Carr, I've always been a vagabond at heart. And now that I've found you, we'll just be vagabonds together. Father and Mado will leave us very much to each other. Their scientific leanings, you know. And, oh, it'll just be wonderful. It's you that'll make it wonderful, sweetheart. Carr drew her close. The stars shone still more brightly and beckoned anew. Vagabonds, all of them. Like the gypsies of old, but with vastly more territory to roam. The humdrum routine of his old life seemed very far behind. 
He wondered what Courtney Davis would say if he could see him now. Wordless happiness had come to him, and he let his thoughts wander out into the limitless expanse of the heavens, stargazing still, just he and Aura. End of Vagabonds of Space Part 23 Chapter 10 Recording by Jason Dempsey Highland, New York Section 24 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reader's Corner, Part 1. From a Science Fiction Fiend. Dear Editor, I agree with you about the reprinting of old stories, because you would only force older science fiction readers to read the same stuff that they have read before. Any science fiction fiend like myself will surely have the reprinted story in his collection of magazines. The size of your magazine is perfect, but your paper is not very good. As for me, I don't care about your paper because your stories are so very good that the paper doesn't matter. My favorite story, and one of the best stories that I have ever read so far, is Murder Madness. It has a very original idea and holds your interest from the very start. I am also for a more often publication of your magazine. About twice a month. Rupert Jones, New York, New York. Valuable Suggestions Dear Editor, The July issue of Astounding Stories is one of the best issues you have so far published. Arthur J. Burks sure is a master at writing science fiction tales. The first installment of Earth the Marauder was swell. Harl Vincent is another very good author. His novelette, The Terror of Air Level Six, was a close second. The Forgotten Planet by S. P. Wright, Beyond the Heaviside Layer by S. P. Meek, and From an Amber Block by Tom Curry were all good stories. The cover illustration was the best yet. I hope that the next dozen covers do not have blue backgrounds. Other colors you might have are green, red, pink, orange, yellow, black, and light and dark purple. When will Edmund Hamilton's first story be published in Astounding Stories? Have you received any stories by Stanton Coblentz, A. Hyatt Verrill, Ed Earl Rep, John W. Campbell, Jr., Edward E. Chapelow, and Edgar Rice Burroughs yet? Why not have a page devoted to the authors? You could print a picture and tell something about one author each month. I think that an illustration representing science fiction would look good on the contents page. I hope that Wesso will soon be illustrating every story in Astounding Stories, or that you will obtain another artist equally as good, if possible. Is it possible for you to use a better and thinner grade of paper? I save all my Astounding Stories, and I like them to be thin so they will not take up so much room. Jack Darrow, 4225 North Spaulding Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Not yet. Dear Editor, I have just received your July issue of Astounding Stories, and I must say that it is the best yet. The only thing wrong with it, in my opinion, is that it is too small. The size should be at least 9 by 12. Also, it should be a semi-monthly, or at least accompanied by a quarterly and annual. The stories in the July issue are wonderful, all except Murray Leinster's serial, which does not belong in your magazine. If you have any intention of putting an annual or a quarterly on the market, will you be so kind as to communicate with me as I am very much interested in your magazine? Louis Wensler, 1933 Woodbine Street, Brooklyn, New York. Ever since. Dear Editor, I want to tell you what I think of your new magazine. I think it's great. I stopped in a drug store and saw Astounding Stories on the newsstand. I bought it and have been buying it ever since. I am fourteen years old, but I am interested in science. Why not get a story by Edgar Rice Burroughs and some more by Ray Cummings? I wish success to your wonderful magazine. William McCalvey, 1244 Beach Street, St. Paul, Minnesota. Not one poor story yet. Dear Editor, I agree with you that reprints should absolutely be kept out of your magazine. I admit that there are many stories of unusual merit among the reprints, but I favor new and fresher stories. In your last issue, June, I consider The Moon Master as being the best story, closely followed by Out of the Dreadful Depths. The Cavern World came next, 
followed by Giants of the Ray, Brigands of the Moon, and Murder Madness. I have not found one poor story in your magazine yet, and never expect to. I, for one, favor a larger-sized magazine with a five-cent increase in price, or, at least, if the magazine must remain small, I would like to see a quarterly out on the third Thursday every three months. I am extremely pleased to see that an interplanetary story by R. F. Starzl will appear in your next issue. Please have more of his stories, if possible. Forrest James Ackerman, 530 Staples Avenue, San Francisco, California. Likes Present Size Dear Editor, Best Stories in the Last Two Issues C. D. Willard's Out of the Dreadful Depths, Excellent Charles W. Diffin's The Moon Master, Very Good C. Well P. Wright's Forgotten Planet, Fairly Good I am a new reader, but interested in these kinds of stories. I am pleased to see that your readers criticize freely. A story that will please one reader will not interest another, perhaps and it may not be the fault of the author's ability so much as that he doesn't like that type of story. Out of the Dreadful Depths, by C. Willard, is the best story I've read for some time. I could not see a single way it could be improved. The Moon Master, by Charles Diffin, was just as good, but I didn't like the ending so well. I certainly hope Mr. Diffin will write more stories like it, especially using his same three leading characters. The Forgotten Planet by Mr. Wright was well written and pretty good in spite of the fact that I don't like that type of story so well. Murder Madness by Murray Leinster was well written and the characters interesting and real, but I didn't like his subject. I hope for more and different stories from him. Earth the Marauder by Arthur J. Burks looks as though it was going to be a record winner for me, accomplish the impossible, and make a good story from a story of the future. I don't like horror stories, crazy stories, and stories written far into the future as brigands of the moon. These stories make light of the vast distances of space and are too weird, droll, and fail to give a single shiver down my old backbone. They are strange and inhabited by strange people. No story can give the faintest idea of the space between those mighty suns of the universe. Most of them have more imagination than scientific knowledge. Earth, the marauder, is an exception. I would much rather hear stories of primeval days of the lost Atlantis before Earth was populated with scientific beings, when the caveman looked up at the unknown, then so near to him, at the moon which was then so close and uninhabited by superior beings, tales of superstition and all mystery stories of the unknown. I like interplanetary stories, if not written too far into the future. I like the present size and shape of your magazine. Best wishes for the success of your magazine, an interested reader, Goffstown, New Hampshire. Likes. Dear Editor, I have just finished reading the July issue of Astounding Stories, and I think every story is simply great, especially The Terror of Air Level 6. That sure is a story. The Forgotten Planet is a corker, too. While reading the letters in the reader's corner, I noticed that almost everyone has a hankering for Edgar Rice Burroughs' stories. Believe it or not, I'm wild about his stories myself, and I'm looking forward to reading his stories in Astounding Stories. It won't make any difference if they'll be originals or reprints, so long as they're Burroughs. Ray Cummings is another one of my favorites, and I always read his stories first. His Brigands of the Moon hit me in the right spot. The Moon Master in the June issue was also a very fine story. Now about this argument about reprinted stories. I think that if at least one reprinted story appeared in each issue of Astounding Stories, it wouldn't hurt its reputation. Here are some reprints that hit the ceiling. The War in the Air by Wells. Taranto the Conqueror by Cummings. The Conquest of Mars by Service. I'm sure the readers would enjoy reading them, but if you are persistent about avoiding reprints, then we'll have to do without them. Paul Nikolaev. 4325 South Sealy Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Wants Sequel Dear Editor, I have read every issue of Astounding Stories, though I can barely afford it. I like it very much. The best novels were in order 1. The Moon Master 2. Phantoms of Reality 3. Spawn of the Stars 4. Terror of Air Level 6 In the July issue you published a story 
Earth the Marauder, which promises to be even better than the Skylark of Space, that once came out in another magazine. I like Harl Vincent, Ray Cummings, Arthur Burks, and Martian stories best. Interplanetary stories always agree with me. Burroughs is an excellent author. I like his Martian books. The Beetle Horde, in the first two issues, was very good. But why not give a sequel about the other and more terrible creatures in the earth whom the madman spoke of? Fourth dimensionals are sometimes good. You should have reprints by Burroughs, Cummings, and Merritt. I am eagerly waiting for the next issue. Do not enlarge the magazine because I cannot afford it. Don't publish stories like From an Amber Block. They're rotten. Publish more future and interplanetary stories. Joseph Edelman, 721 to Kalb Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. Stands Pat. Dear Editor, I have read all the issues of A.S. since the date of publication, and I think that there is no other magazine like it on the market. I would like to offer a few suggestions contrary to most of your readers, in other words, Jack Darrow and Charles Barrett. 1. Keep magazine in present size and price. 2. Issue it only once a month. If it was issued semi-monthly, the writers would soon run out of ideas, and the readers would get sick of it if they read it so often anyway. 3. Keep up the style of stories now running. In other words, keep the science a little in the background. Do not let it monopolize the story. I get other magazines that do not follow the last-mentioned rule, and the result is the stories are full of machines going ten thousand miles per hour, etc., pink, black, purple, and eleventeen other colored rays. As a result, the stories are drier than the Sahara Desert. The illustrations are fine, okay, as they are. Walter O'Brien, 6 Hagman Place, North Bergen, New Jersey. Trial by Readers Dear Editor, When Astounding Stories first appeared on the newsstands, a brand new science fiction magazine, I was prejudiced against it as a competitor to the existing magazines, one that might carry an inferior quality of science fiction so closely approaching the supernatural as to practically disregard science. In a few cases, as with very good writers like A. Merritt and H. P. Lovecraft, this is permissible, but otherwise not at all so. In the first issue, the stolen mind seemed to bear me out, but then there was Tanks. I bought the next issue, much better, and then the third showed the Soul Master very well written, but not quite science, as related. Yet Cold Light held me on, and Brigands of the Moon. There was no danger of my dropping off now. In the current issue, Murder Madness and The Power and the Glory stand out as mileposts in the history of science fiction. The rest are not far behind, though, as a matter of fact, Beyond the Heaviside Lair and Earth the Marauder have more discernible flaws than the rest. Just for example, a layer of organic matter would raise cane with astronomy due to refraction. Air is bad enough, but the writing overwhelms the error. You have certainly assembled a group of excellent authors, new and old, and I am glad to see the promise of R. F. Starzl in the next issue. His Madness of the Dust is one of the most naturally written interplanetary stories I have read. Logical and clear, just as it would happen to anybody. And now for the big question, that of reprints. You seem to have already decided the answer, and have defended your action well. But I wonder if it is well enough. By far your best argument is your last, authors must eat, with which I have no quarrel at all. Still, one classic serial a year or at most two might not prove too harmful. Following back, I reach a statement concerning the Saturday Evening Post. In the past it has published hundreds of the world's best stories, and never reprinted. True, but why? Because these stories were all available in book form, in libraries and bookstores, in original or new editions, or in the Grosset and Dunlap list of perpetually printed best sellers. It is possible to read them for years after publication, but try to find the past masterpieces of science fiction. With the exception of Burroughs' books, most were never printed in book form. Even books by Wells and Verne, classics of their kind, are gone, totally gone, even from the shelves of libraries. Many of Verne's best stories were never translated from the French, and the other classics of which readers write, classics familiar to most of us only by name and a few lucky tastes of others, newer works by the same authors, are absolutely gone annihilated. 
Their best works are beyond the reach of the reader. Only by republication, in magazine or book, can they be revived in an age when they will be remembered and preserved. An Age Awake to Science and Science Fiction Other magazines are doing it, one or two to the year, and it may be that you need not reprint. But the reservoir of the past is large, and a few cannot drain it. This leads to your first argument, that better stories are being written today. They are. Better than the average of the past. But not better than the classics. It would be folly to say that because the short story is a modern development, and because Galsworthy or Walpole or Reimark are better than the average of yesterday, to our present tastes, that the classics of the past should be scrapped. The analogy I feel is good. The classics of general literature have their place in history. The classics of science fiction should have theirs. There are dozens better than the general run of present work, by A. Merritt, Homer Eon Flint, George Allen England, Austin Hall, John Tain, Garrett P. Service, Ralph Milne Farley, Ray Cummings, and others that stood out in an age when science fiction was considered pure fantasy or imaginative trash. In the present age, they would be still better, and this time they would not be lost to the world, for there are publishers and readers who would preserve them. You may adhere to your decision, but to my mind, and I think to far more than one percent of other minds, reprints of classics are essential, actually vitally necessary. Try to find out what a ballot would show, again from the author's point of view. Up to now Burroughs has had all the breaks as to book publication. Now Ray Cummings and others are being published. An author must eat, give him a chance, by reviving his best efforts, and bringing them to public attention, so that a publisher will find them worthy of publication. Most of the masters of science fiction are alive. Give them a chance to eat. Two, a great many of the best modern authors are modern readers. Ask them if they would be willing to see one of the best stories of the past reissued each year, stories unpublished in existing magazines for ten years or more. I certainly hope you will alter your decision. And now to reverse some other decisions of readers. The size is quite all right and very handy for binding purposes. Mr. Mack to the contrary. Incidentally, the staples are so placed as to make binding simple. Also contrary to Mr. Darrow, I prefer the artist Gould to Wesso for interior illustrations, though Wesso is best for mechanical illustrations. Incidentally, Give us the name of the artist for each story, especially when the illustrations are unsigned, as in the April issue. Wessel's best cover for you has been that for April, illustrating Monsters of Moyen. It shows his best style very well. As to my favorite type of science fiction, any kind, if well written, will do. As it happens, the King of Authors, A. Merritt, has a type all his own, as Mr. Bryant notes, which is unbeatable, and my favorite. However, at times a good writer may fall down in his fundamental assumptions. I don't care where or how far he goes, so long as he starts with something that present-day science does not deny. Here is where the soul-master fell down, and even more so, the soul-snatcher. Better leave souls and astrals and egos alone, except in very, very rare cases, when an author turns up who can make you believe in them as mechanical entities. As a science fiction fan, a student of chemistry, and a hopeful author, I will probably write to the reader's corner as often as I want to blow off steam regarding science fiction or the way in which you are running the magazine. I hope I won't be considered an utter nuisance, and will be given a trial by jury, a jury of readers. P. Schuyler Miller, 302 South 10 Brock Street, Scotia, New York. End of Part 1 Section 25 of Astounding Stories, 11, November 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reader's Corner, Part 2. Handy to Hold. Dear Editor, I wish to say that I have the seven numbers of Astounding Stories that have been issued thus far, and I have read them through every word. It is wonderful, and there is no word of fault to be uttered concerning any of them. I think Murder Madness is the best story you have printed so far, but they are all good in different ways. 
You received some letters that surprise me. How anyone can ask you to change the makeup to the blanket sheet form is more than I can see. It is so handy to hold and to read as it is now. I do hope you will not change it. No, there is so much that one wants to read these days that I do not advocate issuing twice a month. One issue each month is just right, but I do wish you would increase the number of pages to at least the number in Five Novels magazine. Of course, you would want twenty-five cents for it then, and that is all right. I am glad that you refuse to give us reprints. We do not want them. Astounding Stories is a gem, and I hope to read it for the remainder of my life. Keep right on with the good work. Will S. Cushing, 21 Cottage Street, Abington, Massachusetts. We hope so, too. Dear Editor, Your July issue of Astounding Stories was wonderful. Your magazine is improving greatly. Murder Madness is a great story, and Earth the Marauder is one of the best stories I have ever read. I hope the other parts of it are just as interesting as the first part. Mick Scott's, 115 West 16th Avenue, Gary, Indiana. Another Sequel Dear Editor, Well, I have so much to say, or rather would like to say, for your magazine. I like it in every detail but one, which is waiting a whole month for the rest of my stories. I wish you would give us the third sequel of Out of the Ocean's Depths. Let the young scientist discover a way to perform matrimony between the girl of the ocean and the man, and then let their child live either in or out of water. There could be two more good stories or sequels of Out of the Ocean's Depths. I like them all. I like Murder Madness, too. It seems as though it is really real, and not fiction. I wish you would get the book out twice a month. Mrs. B. R. Woods, Cott, Arkansas from author to author dear editor since astounding stories began you have published a goodly number of really remarkable stories chief among which in my estimation are the following spawn of the stars by c w diffin brigands of the moon by ray cummings monsters of moyen by arthur j burks the atom smasher by victor rousseau and the moon master c w diffin but none of these can compare with diffin's last short story the power and the glory which appeared in the last July issue, for originality of theme, clever phraseology, and excellent literary craftsmanship, it stands alone, a little masterpiece. Its author should be congratulated. To the best of my knowledge, Mr. Diffin is a newcomer in science fiction. The first story of his that I read was Spawn of the Stars. Keep his pen busy, Mr. Editor. He's valuable, and I don't mean maybe. If I could write a story like The Power and the Glory, I'd certainly congratulate myself. L. A. Eschbach, 225 Chestnut Street, Reading, Pennsylvania. Help Me Spellbound, Dear Editor, I happened to read one of your books the other day, Astounding Stories is the one, and I was very much taken up with it. I found that it was a very interesting book indeed. I have no fear in saying that it held me spellbound from the start till the finish. The one that I happened to buy was the issue of May 1930, and the story that gripped me most was Brigands of the Moon. It was very thrilling indeed, and I am very sorry I could not obtain the previous copies so as to start at the beginning. But, however, I am able to obtain a copy every month, and am very pleased, as I would hate to miss a copy again. Well, I hope this letter will reach you safely. Remember me as a contented reader of your magazine. George Young, 447 Canning Street, North. Carlton, N. 4, Melbourne, Australia. We are printing it. Dear Editor, It seems that you have taken a wrong slant on my letter which you published recently. True, I did give you a long list of stories which I wanted to see. But I didn't mean that you should publish only reprints, no new stories. Far from it. Instead, I'd suggest that you give us a classic, say, every six months. This arrangement ought to be okay with everyone. That's that for reprints. About the stories and the authors, they're all right. There's one thing that I like about you that I don't find in the other science fiction magazines. With the very first issue you started off with the authors that are wanted by everyone who reads this type of literature. You began with Cummings, Rousseau, Meek, and Leinster. Hmm, let's see. And you're keeping up the good system by having added Vincent, Starzl, Burks, Curry, Miss Lorraine, Hamilton, etc. But you don't escape entirely unscathed, for the other magazines give us stories from authors which haven't as yet written a story which appeared in your columns. Let's see. 
Besides the stars above, let's add to the galaxy Keller, three cheers. Brewer, Smith, his story The Skylark of Space, ought to have about six sequels. The late Mr. Service, Verrill, Poe, Wells, Verne, Flint, ooh, for that blind spot. Hall, England, Hasta, one story by him is all I've read, but it only whetted my appetite. And Simmons. Oh, yes, the two Taines, the detective of Dr. Keller's and the author. But there's something missing. Hm, ah, A. Merritt. What a writer! How could I have forgotten him? Which reminds me of Burroughs, who has been left out in the rain for quite a while. He belongs back in the fold. Mr. Editor, do you remember way back when you said we should write in to tell you of the stories we want and that you would get them for us? Of course you do. Stories and authors cannot be parted. So get those authors I've listed above and forget about the stories, for they'll all be good. I do not kick about any particular author for the reason that if I tried to write on the same subject they picked out and are picking, my work would be pretty different from what they'd produce, and their works would be the ones that would be published. Please don't read that twice. I hope to be a contributor very soon. In my opinion you should enlarge the size of the magazine, but for heaven's sake don't increase the departments. Every day that we read a paper we learn of what science is doing, and at the end of the month we read the same thing in a magazine which should give us a story instead. The price is just right, but even if the magazine were enlarged and the price boosted to a quarter, do you really think that we get enough material to devour? No. Then what? Get out a quarterly and please don't wait about that for the next ten years. This is a pretty lengthy letter, and I don't expect you to print it, but I want you to get the views of at least one devoted reader. Isidore Manson, 544 Myrtle Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. Every single one. Dear Editor, I certainly received a pleasant surprise when I glanced at the table of contents for the August issue. When one sees Victor Rousseau, R. F. Starzl, Murray Leinster, Harl Vincent, and Edmund Hamilton, one knows that the issue is bound to be a good one. I wish to congratulate you on the way you have been running Astounding Stories. If you intend to keep giving us the authors you are now, throughout your whole career, you are a lawbreaker. What I mean by that is that no other magazine has kept a high grade of authors very long. The old magazines on the market have once had stories by the authors you are giving us now, but they never kept those authors long. If you keep the authors you have now, you may well be assured of success. Silver Dome undoubtedly copped the prize for this issue. It could not have been better. The Lord of Space was a very good story. The Planet of Dread was another very good story. The Second Satellite by Hamilton was excellent. For once in his life Hamilton has written a story that has not the same old plot all his other stories have. I wish to congratulate him on the best story he has ever written. The Flying City was the same thing all over again. The world in danger, and suddenly our magnificent hero comes along, takes a hand, and presto the danger is over. Of course he has to meet the beautiful girl and fall in love with her, and at the end of the story marry her. Remember, history repeats itself. Have you ever heard of the world being saved by one man? No, neither have I. The world will never be saved by one man. Therefore all those stories are the bunk. Murder Madness was wonderful. I expect to see it in the talkies before long. It could be filmed easily enough, couldn't it? I know it certainly would make a wonderful picture. I expect to see you publish Murder Madness and Brigands of the Moon in book form. If you do, I will try my darndest to get a copy. Also in my list of good authors up there I forgot to mention Arthur J. Burks. Now I wish to broach the subject of a quarterly to you. I think Astounding Stories should have one. Every other science fiction magazine has, so let us have one too. Won't you? You can give us over twice as much as you do in the monthly and charge about fifty cents a copy. Have one good book and several short stories in each issue. No serials. How about it? And now let's talk a little about astounding stories. Why not cut the paper smooth the way you do in five novels monthly? It would make the magazine look a lot better. It would also be a lot easier to find one's place when one has to lay the book down for a moment. The last reason may sound trivial, but it's really annoying to try to find one's place among those bulky pages. The paper you use now gives the magazine an inferior appearance when compared to others of its kind. 
it certainly would be a relief to see you use better paper. Won't you please consider the points I have brought out in my letter? Gabriel Kirchner, Box 301, Temple, Texas What Authors? Dear Editor, Astounding Stories is improving with every issue. However, you would have to go far to beat the August issue. It can be called an all-star number. What authors? Hamilton, Rousseau, Starzl, Burks, and others, all of whom are among my favorite authors. The stories were so good that it is almost impossible to pick out the best one. However, after some thought I have finally chosen Hamilton's The Second Satellite. Earth the Marauder is a close second. I hope you have many more stories by Edmund Hamilton. I see that the cover is the first one to be of a different color. Please have a new color each month. There are a few ways in which astounding stories may be improved. Enough of the readers have mentioned improving the quality of the paper, so that I do not have to comment on this. An editorial each month would improve the magazine greatly. Here's hoping that astounding stories becomes a semi-monthly soon, very soon. Michael Fogaris, 157 4th Street, Passaic, New Jersey. Stands Pat. Dear Editor, I have been a reader of your magazine for some time. I hope to continue reading it in the future. I notice in the reader's corner that some want reprints. Others want the size of the magazine changed. I say give us fresh stories and leave the size of the magazine alone. In my opinion, the best stories in your July issue were Beyond the Heavy Side Layer and Earth the Marauder. They were both fine. Keep up the good work. Carlson Abernathy, P.O. Box 584, Clearwater, Florida. End of Part 2 End of Reader's Corner And End of Astounding Stories, November 1930His answering thought, first, was of fiercest rage, then conciliatory in nature. He'll receive you, and listen to your arguments, though he promises nothing. Is that satisfactory? Yes, Carr and Mado were agreed. At least it would give them a chance to look over the ground, and to make plans, should any occur to them. The nomads circled over the heart of the city, and soon Mado saw a suitable landing space. They settled gracefully in an open area, close by the building indicated by Didus as that of the administration officials of the city. A group of squat, sullen Lotta awaited them, and, without speaking a word either of hatred or welcome, led them into the forbidding entrance of the building. Close-set, beady eyes, unbelievably flat features of chalky whiteness, chunky, bowed legs, bare and hairy, long arms with huge, dangling paws, these were the outstanding characteristics of the Lotta. Mado stared straight before him, refusing to display any great interest in the loathsome creatures, but Carr was frankly curious, and as frankly disapproving. Rapaju leered maliciously when the four voyagers stood before him. He looked the incarnation of all that was evil and vile, a monster among monsters. Sensing him to be the more aggressive of the two visitors from doomed planets, he addressed his remarks to Carr. "'You come to plead with the Rapajou,' he sneered, his coast tinged with an outlandish accent, "'to beg for the worthless lives of your com Carr thought grimly of the board meetings in faraway New York. Rapajou talked. He told of the armament of his vessels, painting vivid pictures of the destruction to be wrought in the cities of terror, of Mars and Venus. His great hairy paws clutched at imaginary riches when he spoke glowingly of the plundering to follow. He spoke of the women of the inner planets, and Carr half rose from his seat when he observed the lecherous glitter in his beady eyes. Aura! Great God! Was she safe here? He stole a glance at the girl, and a recurrence of the awful fear surged through him. In her leather garment, close-fitting and severe, she looked like a boy. Perhaps they would not know. Besides, there was the perpetual treaty with Europa. It always had been observed, Didus said. As Rapaju expanded upon the glories to come, he told, perforce, of many of the details of the plans. One thing stood out in Carr's mind. The vessels of the Lotta were not equal to the Nomad in many respects. They must carry their entire supply of fuel, from the starting point, 
and this was calculated as but a small percentage in excess of that required to carry them to their destination. Their speed was not as great as the nomads, by at least a third. If the nomad led the fleet from Ganymede, they might be able to get them off their course, cause them to run out of fuel out in the vacuum and absolute zero of space. He kicked Mado under the table and arose to ask a few leading questions. Aura was whispering to her father, and he nodded his head as if in complete agreement with what she was saying. Section 22 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Vagabonds of Space. Chapter 7 Rapaju. Ditas was setting up and adjusting the complicated mechanisms of his little black case. A dozen vacuum tubes lighted, and a murmur of throbbing energy came from a helix of shining metallic ribbon that topped the whole. Flexible cables led to a cap-like contrivance, which Didis placed on his head. He frowned in concentration. The psycho-ray apparatus, Aura explained. He's sending a message to the city. Evidently, the influence of the ray was directive. They had no inkling of the thoughts transmitted from the alert brain of the scientist, but from the look of satisfaction on his face they could see that he was obtaining the desired contact. Rapajou, he exclaimed, switching off the power of his instrument. Commander of the fleet of the Lotta. I have advised him of our arrival, told him that a Martian and a terrestrial wish to treat with him concerning the proposed invasion of their planets. Will you give us time to talk it over and think about it? Until the hour of departure, if you wish. Carr bowed avoiding Mado's questioning eyes. He looked at Aura, where she stood at the side of Didis. She flashed him a guarded smile. He knew that she understood. Rapaju relaxed. He was confident he could bribe these puerile foreigners to help him in the great venture, and sadly he needed such help. The Lotta were not navigators. Their knowledge of the heavens was sadly incomplete. They had no maps of the surfaces of the planets to be visited. Their simultaneous blows would be far more effective, and the campaign much shorter if they could choose the most vital centers for the initial attacks. Now, he said, that we understand one another, let us talk further of the plans. Then you will be able to consider carefully before making your decision. Rapaju could be diplomatic when he wished. Carr longed to sink his fingers in the hairy throat but he smiled hypocritically and found an opportunity to wink meaningfully at Mado. This was going to be good, and who knew? Perhaps they might find some way to outwit these mad savages. To think of them in control of the inner planets was revolting. They retired to a small room with Rapaju and four of his lieutenants, Didis and Aura accompanying them. Aura sat close to Carr at the circular table in Rapaju's council, Patriots, for the will for your cities. We come to reason with you, replied Carr haughtily, if you are capable of reasoning. What is this incredible thing you are planning? Mado gasped at the effrontery of his friend, but Carr was oblivious of the warning looks cast in his direction. Enough of that, snapped Rapaju. I'll do the talking, you the reasoning. I have a proposition to make you, and if you know what's best, you'll agree. Otherwise, you'll be the first of the terrestrials to die. Is that clear? Clear enough, all right, growled Carr. What do you mean, a proposition? Ha! I thought you'd listen. My offer is the lives of you and your companion in exchange for your assistance in guiding my fleet to the capital cities of your countries. Not that our plans will be changed if you refuse, but that much time will be saved in this manner, and quick victory made certain without undue sacrifice of valuable property. 
You! You! Carr stammered in anger. But there was no use in raising a rumpus now. They'd only kill him. Something might be accomplished if he pretended to accede. Go on with your story, he finished lamely. In addition to sparing your lives, I'll place you both in high position after we seize your respective planets, make you chief officers in the prison lands we intend to establish for your countrymen. What do you say?'